Chapter 2 will review the intoxication to various alcohols. Alcohols cause CNS depression primarily through their GABA mimetic activity, a little bit like that of uh, benzodiazepines or barbiturates. All alcohols will also be associated with metabolic acidosis because of the metabolism of these chemicals. If you look on this first slide or in your book, you re might remember actually from biochemistry that alcohols are metabolized primarily by dehydrogenases. Alcohol dehydrogenase is the first enzyme taking the actual ethylene glycol, methanol or ethanol to an aldehyde and then following this an aldehyde dehydrogenase brings the final metabolite to an acid, hence the acidosis. Well, there are three major alcohols to uh, be comfortable with with intoxication. Acute intoxication to ethyl and glycol are classically tested in situations such as accidents or suicide attempts. Ethyl and glycol is antifreeze. And as antifreeze, uh, remember that this is a liquid that is very bright in color, very sweet in taste, and a child could classically be attracted to it thinking that they're simply drinking some Kool-Aid. Unfortunately, ethylene glycol is severely toxic, not only because of CNS depression and metabolic acidosis, but also because of the unique toxicity of oxalic acid. Oxalate makes very sharp crystals and tends to cause tremendous tubule damage in the kidney. It results in ATN, or acute tubular necrosis. Of course, we know well from pathology that acute tubular necrosis as a common cause of acute renal failure is really good prognosis providing the patient survives the weeks of renal failure and dialysis. Nonetheless, this reversible injury is the unique point of ethylene glycol intoxication, so remember it well. For methanol, methanol is often referred to as wood alcohol. Methanol is often a contaminant of alcoholic beverages, particularly when adults like to make their own alcohol, maybe in their own little wood barrels, and then in the process of putting yeast and fermenting the sugars in this barrel, uh, result in the formation of methanol as a byproduct. It is also metabolized by dehydrogenases, and here the primary unique metabolite is the formaldehyde. Formaldehyde we use regularly in pathology in order to pickle tissues, literally to preserve tissue, fixate them so that then we can keep them forever. Well, imagine this being formed in your tissues, particularly in your brain. It does mean that besides the CNS depression with the potential of respiratory failure, the severe metabolic acidosis, there is also significant neurotoxicity. And if the patient does not die from the actual methanol intoxication, they will suffer significant optic nerve and retinal damage that should result in blindness. Now, both of these types of alcohols are certainly not going to be used chronically. It's either you used it once and you nearly died and you'll never use it again, or you actually got exposed to these chemicals and unfortunately passed away. So as such, we only describe acute toxicity. And those acute toxicity Notice how the acidosis and the specific toxicity of nephrotoxicity and ocular damage are associated with metabolites. So forever, the idea has been, let's prevent the metabolism of the parent drugs. To do so, historically, IV ethanol has been used. IV ethanol has been used because ethanol itself has higher affinity for alcohol dehydrogenase than ethylene glycol and methanol do. However, then we suffer the acute effect of another toxin, the alcohol itself. So, as such, what is really relevant to remember is a long-acting alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor known as formepazole. Formepazole, by blocking the dehydrogenases, is actually going to prevent those parent chemicals from turning into their potentially toxic counterparts. As such, you would remain with a patient with severe CNS depression in part due to the GABA activity of ethylene glycol and methanol, so supportive management of CNS depression would still be required with intubation, mechanical ventilation, and hemodialysis would be used to remove those high alcoholic levels. The fact would be that you would not suffer the toxicity from the aldehydes and from the acids. 
when you look at ethanol, ethanol must be reviewed for both its acute but also its chronic toxicity. It is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to an aldehyde called acetaldehyde and then by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase to acetic acid. Endpoint of this acetate is to then be combined with a coenzyme A to become acetyl coenzyme A. This is why the tissues that metabolize alcohol, primarily the liver, can derive upwards of 7 kilocalories per gram of alcohol. So it is an energetic product, but generally for the liver, causing a number of liver pathologies on chronic administration, certainly. Now, ethanol itself is a strong CNS depressant, will cause metabolic acidosis, particularly ketoacidosis, and does have the unique metabolite acetaldehyde with its own specific toxicities. Acetaldehyde buildup is responsible for the hangover effect. Hangover effect consists primarily in most people in severe nausea and vomiting. Uh, you may remember that in severe intoxication, patients may develop malory vice, even boar halves type of syndromes, malory vice being laceration, longitudinal tears along the lower portion of the esophagus causing severe bleeding. And you of course remember that boar halves syndrome is when there is complete disconnection because of retching between the esophagus and the stomach. Otherwise, acetaldehyde, classically as a strong vasodilator, will be associated with tremendous headaches and a potential for hypotension and reflex arrhythmias. Well, when you look at these acute effects, they are distinguishable, therefore, from the ethylene glycol or methanol intoxication. Some pathology not present in here that I would still want you to remember is that acute alcoholic intoxication is also associated with two significant organ damage, that of the liver with the potential of acute fulminant hepatitis. You may want to remind yourself of the reversible steatosis and the potential for irreversible damages resulting particularly in the accumulation of mallory bodies, which are primarily made of cytokeratin. And the other major toxicity would be the one that would present possibly with epigastric pain radiating to the back. It's a stabbing type of pain and result in shock and possibility of disseminated intravascular coagulation in your patient. If you're thinking acute pancreatitis, you of course remember well that acute alcoholic intoxication is also severely damaging to a pancreas. So, providing you remember this, then we could go into the chronic intoxication with this drug. Because ethanol is normally not immediately deadly, some people, through the abuse potential of the drug, may become chronic alcoholics. And this is where you'll do now bridges not as much through pathology, but primarily to biochemistry. The buildup of NADH in the liver cell of the patient will result in a reversal, in a way, of gluconeogenesis. And because chronic alcoholics are generally patients or individuals who drink alcohol without eating, they're actually in the glucagon world of biochemistry, the blood expecting supply from liver cells of glucose to distribute to critical tissue such as CNS or red blood cells. That decreased gluconeogenesis will result in significant fasting hypoglycemia. You may want to add the word fasting in front of hypoglycemia in those patients. So we know we'll have to actually administer glucose to chronic alcoholics. Well, talking about that glucose, let's look at chronic acetaldehyde for a second. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase is one of these enzymes using several cofactors and therefore having big requirement on vitamins. For instance, shown to you in the diagram, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase requires lots of folate and also some thiamine to do its job. This is how a chronic alcoholic will drive down his or her thiamine levels and become thiamine deficient. You know, what we refer to as beriberi or uh, resulting in pathologies such as Wernicke-Korsakoff, which affects the CNS, particularly with infarction of mammillary bodies, the cerebellum with ataxia and so forth, psychosis, and also the dilated cardiomyopathy risk. Now, from your biochemistry, Let's not forget that uh, thiamine is also required for dehydrogenases that are part of carbohydrate metabolism. So as such, an important clinical point that is tested on any step, really, is the fact that if I'm going to 
actually correct the glycemia of a chronic alcoholic, I must not forget to co-administer, if not previously administer, IV thiamine in order to allow the glucose to be adequately metabolized. Hyperosmolar coma, otherwise, would potentially be the result of glucose administration without thiamine. Well, with this in mind, hypoglycemia from decreased gluconeogenesis is certainly a point to remember well. As gluconeogenesis is reversed, one primary precursor of glucose in this pathway is lactate. And normally, we wanted lactate to become pyruvate, so that the pyruvate would then go up to glucose. In order to do this, it would have required NAD in order to become NADH. Here's the issue. If the alcoholic has very high NADH level, then obviously we will not go lactate to pyruvate, but rather pyruvate towards lactate. This deprivation of a major substrate of gluconeogenesis results not only in the fasting hypoglycemia, but also in lactic acidosis. That lactic acidosis is significant, of course, in the patient, and with lactate being a weak acid, its competition with urate for excretion can result in gout in chronic alcoholics, adding yet another layer of pathology to that alcoholic patient. Lactate simply competes with urate for excretion. Other points in, in between meals uh, in the glucagon world, this is a situation where fat has been mobilized and is arriving to liver cells in order to be metabolized. However, let's not forget that the alcohol itself is a source of ATP for this liver. As such, why use the fat? Because of this, as the metabolism of alcohol supplies the ATP, the fat accumulates. Another substrate of gluconeogenesis requiring a dehydrogenase and NAD to be used is glycerol phosphate. This glycerol phosphate accumulation, because of high NADH, will then allow it to combine with fatty acid and result in a fatty liver. Of course, this fatty liver down the road will cause some cirrhosis with portal hypertension, a cirrhosis that tends to uh, result from centrilobular necrosis in the hepatic lobule. Finally, we must remember that with the in-between meals world is a tremendous degree of proteolysis. This degree of proteolysis, I can see at least two pathological correlates to it. One, the fact that then we'll see muscle wasting, and you can see this well in the habitus of chronic alcoholic with skinny arms, skinny legs, yet the big belly of hypertension. And secondly, as you degrade protein and amino acids, let's not forget we're releasing ammonia. And with liver failure, hyperammonemia is going to be a big worry in chronic alcoholics. So, you have here some nice idea of what chronic alcoholism would result in. If you were to add to this point such as chronic pancreatitis potential, also issues such as chronic hepatitis um, prior to the cirrhosis, then you would nearly have a full picture. Except, you may still want to remind yourself also that chronic alcoholics are at risk of developing certain malignancies. Do you remember which one? One would have to be the uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, and certainly the potential for stomach cell cancer, particularly the signet ring cell cancer. Well, where is the pharmacology in all this? Uh, let's not lose track that there is one point of farm in there that is pretty relevant. The issue of the drug disulfiram. And as I'm looking at disulfiram up there, this is a chemical that inhibits pretty strongly acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. As such, the buildup of acetaldehyde should cause negative feelings in the patients who take too much alcohol. Well, you know, the behavioral scientists then had this grand idea that through negative reinforcement, feeling bad, potentially the patient would decide maybe it's not worth drinking alcohol. And the idea of using disulfiram as an end abuse drug was formulated back in the 1960s, then quickly dropped because of the severe effects of disulfiram. To that extent, really, disulfiram is now more of an issue of drugs that have disulfiram like effect. What I think is the rule you should develop from this is if you look at any drug that has azole in its name, 
Well, it sounds a little bit like formepezole. You see the zole? And formepezole was a dehydrogenase inhibitor that was quite relevant of blocking the metabolism of acetylene glycol and methanol. In turn, it means other drugs with that azole or zole structure will tend to have a similar effect and in slowing metabolism of alcohol cause their buildup and the potential intoxication. Well, metronidazole is an antibiotic that has strong disulfiram-like effect to the extent that people should not drink alcohol unless they plan on having nausea, vomiting, hypotension, headaches, and potential worsening of a CNS depressant effect of alcohol itself as everything builds up upstream. There are a number of antibiotics with azole structures. For instance, certain cephalosporins have azoles in their structure. If you look at the drug cephalperazone, you see the azole. But a little bit like sulfonamide hypersensitivities in the diuretic section of the cardiac chapters, you don't always have the luxury of recognizing the word azo or azon in the name of a drug. So if you were seeing things like ketoconazole, aripiprazole, or meprazole, that's easy. What if you were seeing the drug cefotitan, or chlorpropamide, an oral sulfonylurea, or griselfolvin, an antifungal? Well, unless you knew there was disulfiram-like effects, since we're not chemists, we'd be at a loss telling our patients to avoid alcohol. So unfortunately, there are drugs to commit to memory. Uh, definitely between you and I, make sure you know at the very least the drug metronidazole. It's really the prototypical disulfiram-like effect drugs. Alcohol and pregnancy is also a significant worry. This is a topic that has been more likely approached in your behavioral sciences. Can you tell me, for example, what is the most common cause of mental retardation in the United States and in the Western world? Notice, I did not ask you about a genetic cause of mental retardation. So, those of you who are thinking, I know, it's Down syndrome, and those others of you who are thinking, wait a minute, uh, because of checking alpha fetoprotein level, maybe we don't have as much Down syndrome, so it's fragile X, you would be wrong in the answer. Because if I'm asking plainly about mental retardation without the word genetic, I'm asking you actually about fetal alcohol syndrome. And alcohol causes marked CNS dysfunction and mental retardation in the little babies of mothers who are chronic alcoholic. Besides those psychological type of effects, there are known physical detriments in the fetal alcohol syndrome. The fact that the baby will be of short stature, has marked hypoplastic features of the face and a small head are uh, very characteristic of chronic exposure in utero to the chemical alcohol. Well, this will end our chapter on alcohol.